as Elijah said on uh, the video, we're going to be looking today at uh, chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. And the focus, the, the title of the message is Preoccupied with Problems or Poised for Possibilities. And of course, the word poised just means to be marked by balance and equilibrium. And so you and I are always confronted whether we're going to be preoccupied with the problems all around us or whether we are going to be poised for the possibilities that God is going to bring into our lives uh, to help us. And so we're focused on obstacles and opposition at times, and, but God wants us to uh, be focused on optimism and opportunity. And so today we're going to look at uh, how God works in the uh, mind and heart of the Apostle Paul uh, who really uh, had all kinds of issues uh, in his life, but uh, he was positive about what God is able to do. And so this portion of Scripture today, we're going to look at an opportunity provided by God himself for the Apostle Paul in verse 12. We're going to look in verse 13 about how Paul really had an oppressive experience and then in verses 14 through 17, we're going to focus on an optimistic outlook uh, that Paul had as he faced all of those problems. I'm going to read verses 12 through 17 from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and then we're going to look to the Lord in prayer before we study this great passage of Scripture. The Apostle Paul says in verse 12, When I came to Troas... To preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was opened for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Well, back in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, this is an exciting portion of Scripture. I love this, these, uh, this passage. My prayer has been throughout the week that you might enjoy and get as excited about this passage of Scripture as uh, I am personally as I study this and, and as I read it. As we've already mentioned, the Apostle Paul is really focused here on whether or not we are going to be preoccupied with problems, with difficulties, disappointments, disasters all around us, or whether we're going to uh, be poised uh, for possibilities, whether we focus on uh, God and whether we understand that God has a plan for us and that it is God who will help us. So in life, we need to be poised. We need to, we need to have that balance of life in which you know, we're careful that we don't fall over. If you've ever fallen and, and uh, you, you, know, you kind of slip, and sometimes you're able to catch yourself. I think that's what happened to Paul here in this passage of Scripture. Uh, as you'll see in just a few minutes, I, I think Paul had some difficulties that he was having a hard time dealing with. And uh, so he, he kind of uh, focused on all of the opposition and the obstacles. But uh, I think he, he caught himself, so to speak, before he totally fell over and hit the ground. And there are other times, if you think about life, that you fall and you, you know that you're falling and you sense that there's no way that, you know, you can grab something and, and you know that it's, it's almost over you're going to hit the ground. And I, I think so, so Paul is dealing here then with whether or not our focus is going to be on those obstacles or opposition, or whether we're going to focus on 
uh, optimism and the opportunities that God will give to us, even in the midst of difficulty, to uh, honor and glorify him. And so I, I think that, uh, you know, it all depends on who you really are trusting, whether you're trusting yourself or other people, or whether your trust is truly in God. Now, to be sure, uh, I think that when we talk about, you know, uh, being optimistic uh, or whether you're pessimistic uh, really depends on a lot of different things. You know, what, what we're, when we talk about really being uh, poised for, for possibilities and being positive, you know, th that's a mindset. That's an attitude that we have. And uh, a lot of things are involved in that. I think probably even our personalities are involved in that. Some people have personalities that I mean they're really pessimistic people. Everything's a downer, and they're, they're, they're never upbeat. And uh, if you find yourself down at times, and if you're honest, at least with yourself, you think, boy, I don't want to go see such and such, even though he's my friend, because he's going to pull me down more. He's going to, you know, down me even more. And then there are people, though, that when you're down, you know that if you can go spend a little time with them, um, they're, they're upbeat, and, you know, they're going to lift us up and so personality is is clearly involved in this there are people who always see themselves as victims and other people who always see themselves as victors but I think what Paul is talking about here in this portion of scripture is, is a spiritual matter and I think Paul was able to catch himself before he really fell because of his belief system because of his world view of his view of God and how great God is and how good God is and how gracious God is. And so, you know, Paul is, is writing to us, and I think that Paul wants us uh, to realize that we have options or choices before us. Whether or not we're going to be optimistic about even what's happening all around us or we're going to be, be pessimistic. And so I want you to take note that in verse 12, the Apostle Paul really talks about an opportunity provided to him by God. And so here's what he says in verse 12, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was opened for me in the Lord. He, he wants us to know that God had opened a great door for him. And what was the door for? The door was to preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was what the major issue was. You see, so often, and Paul deals with this, I think, in this passage, too, that too often we major on minor issues and we minor on the major issues. The major issue here was this, that God opened a door for the Apostle Paul to tell people about Jesus Christ because Paul realized that everybody needed a Savior. Everyone needed Jesus. And Paul realized that Jesus was the answer to everyone's problem. But now, is that the world in which we're living? No, I don't think so. But I don't think it was the world in which Paul was living either. Paul was going, swimming upstream, so to speak, in regards to, the, to this. Not everybody wanted to hear the gospel, but Paul realized everybody needed to hear the gospel. This is a great missionary passage of scripture here. And so, I was thinking even this week about this opportunity and how Paul believed everyone needed a savior, but what does the world, what, what does, how does the world view this? Well, I, I, I doubt that you know, Paul would be able to use this quote uh, because they didn't have you know, television, radio, and books to read, but I got thinking this week about a, 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 a statement that Lois Lane made, of all people, in, in Superman Returns. Here's what she said. She said this, the world doesn't need a savior, and neither do I. Now, she wasn't talking about Jesus, to be sure, but I think that's a statement that is really uh, gives us a view of how the world looks at this whole issue of Jesus. The world doesn't need a savior, and neither do I. But you see, you and I do need a savior. And Paul here is, is realizing that God has given him a great opportunity uh, to share the good news of the gospel. And uh, through word and through testimony, uh, he is uh, preaching uh, the gospel of, of Christ. And so you and I need to realize that we need a Savior.
and that Jesus Christ came to uh, this earth to suffer and to die, and, and that the message of uh, the gospel is that Jesus came to this earth, that he died on the cross, that he was buried, and he rose again. That was the message that Paul was concerned about. He was concerned about that message more than any other message that he ever gave. And so it is, uh, uh, you know, the motto of the world that they uh, do not need a savior, but you and I uh, need uh, realize that they do. Well, Paul goes on in verse 13 to talking about an ex- uh, oppressive evidence or uh, experience. And so he tells us then in verse 13, my spirit was not at rest. So even though there was this opportunity, a door of opportunity opened by God, his spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. And so what is Paul telling us here? Well, he's saying that there was all kinds of opposition. And there was opposition to him personally, opposition to Uh, his ministry, and that was great. And Paul was forced to change his well-thought strategic plans. And so here he was in Troas. God opened a door of ministry for him. And uh, Paul then became so discouraged, so depressed, so dejected, so deeply burdened about the church at Corinth that his plans changed, and he left Troas, and he went to Macedonia. Now, it's, it's easy for us to sometimes think that when we're faced with all kinds of difficulties and problems, if somehow we can just run away from it, it all is going to get better. But I want you to notice in chapter 7, the Apostle Paul talks about, about being in uh, Macedonia. And so in verse 5, here's what he says. And even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. And so Paul couldn't run away from the problems that he experienced. And so we realize, because we've talked about it before, that this church at Corinth was riddled uh, with relational and moral and theological problems. And so this was, was a church that was rebellious. They couldn't even accept the leadership of the Apostle Paul. And so they went after him. And I think what happened with Paul was this, that all of the problems, all of the difficulties ended up distracting him uh, and uh, And uh, really, he became preoccupied then with problems. And we need to realize that God doesn't want us distracted from what he's called us here to do. And we need to be careful that we're not distracting other people. We need to be careful that we're not preoccupied with problems instead of doing what God wants us to do. And so here's the Apostle Paul dealing with this whole issue. And he says, well, I finally left Troas, went to Macedonia, but later tells us that even in Macedonia, he had difficulties. I want you to notice also in verse 13 that he wants us to realize that he was looking for Titus and he couldn't find Titus. Uh, Where was Titus? Well, we're not really sure, but he couldn't find Titus. And I think what this shows, though, is this, that Paul realized that ministry and life takes teamwork. I I think that Paul is is telling us here that you don't do life and you don't do ministry uh, all alone, all by yourself. And so I I think this is probably a great verse that we can uh, even uh, take in regards to our life groups. Why are we doing life groups? Well, because we believe that uh, it takes uh, a team to do life and ministry. And in our life groups, it's one of the best places uh, to uh, you know, find people who care about us and uh, love us, that there's strength and that there's wisdom in togetherness. Now, it's interesting when Paul finally did find Titus, Here's what he has to say about finding Titus in chapter 7. So verse 5, we read, here's where Paul says that he went from Troas to Macedonia and found problems there. But notice verse 6, it says this, but God who comforts the downcast, that was Paul, he was downcast, comforted us by how? The coming of Titus. So Titus finally shows up, and Paul feels really good about this, and he tells us in verse 7, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he comforted, uh, that he was comforted by you. And so you comforted Titus, Paul tells them, uh, 
and Titus came and brought comfort and strength uh, to me. And so you and I need to realize that we need what Michael Moore spoke to the men about yesterday morning at a breakfast, and uh, what, that, what his message was, was this, no matter what friends. We all need no matter what friends. And uh, those no matter what friends uh, really are friends that you can say anything to, and you know that it's not going to go anywhere, and you know, if, and maybe if you're wrong in what you say, they, they talk to you about it, but you can say whatever's on your mind and heart. Uh, whatever, uh, you know, uh, whatever, or what, uh, no matter what friend is also a friend that has your back, so to speak. Now, what keeps us from life groups? What keeps us from, from uh, really intimate kind of relationships as believers? Well, there's probably a lot of things, but one in particular, in my mind, is that when you are forsaken by people that you have thought were uh, those no matter what friends, that you, you can, out of fear, not want to join anybody else. I just want you to know that if you've had a bad experience in a life group, try it again. Give it another try. That's what regroup is all about. And uh, if you haven't signed up, or if you, you, you weren't planning to be here for lunch and, and our regroup meeting, I want to encourage you to, uh, you know, after the service, to, to go to this. This is important for us. And uh, I, I think that if you've been hurt in life and, and maybe even in a life group, well, I want to encourage you to uh, try it again. And so Paul really, he, he saw the possibilities here. He still believed that, that God uh, could do the impossible. He saw beyond the darkness and beyond the difficult experiences that he had. Now, what do you see? That's an important question for all of us. What do you see? I mean, do, do you see that God can open a door wide open for you? Maybe the wide open door is in your family to, to share the good news of the gospel with someone, to live a, a, a life that's a testimony of, of God's grace and mercy. You know, maybe God uh, is opening a door for you uh, where you uh, work with your neighbors. Uh, maybe uh, he's opening up a door for you at school or college, maybe in your community at large. But you see, God will open up uh, opportunities for us, and even though we might be experiencing the same types of problems Paul did, God wants us to do what he has called us to do. Now, we need to choose then to focus on the possibilities, uh, the opportunities, not the obstacles. And so Paul persevered, he hung in there. Now, the last thing I want you to take note of then is uh, Paul, in verses 14 through uh, 17, uh, talk about, talks about an optimistic outlook. And so after he talks about Titus, and at this point he didn't have Titus with him, at this point, you know, he, he's been preoccupied with all of these problems, and, and uh, at this point the Apostle Paul is, is distracted, but now somewhere along the line in Macedonia, God speaks to him, and here's what he tells us in a positive way, verse 14. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. And so what is he telling us here? Well, despite the doom and gloom, Paul's focused on the possibilities here, and he wants us to know that God is the one who will lead us to victory and triumph. And so there's three things that I want you to take note in these verses about how God leads us to triumphal uh, procession here. He causes that. In fact, that's what, that, that's what Paul is, is talking about here. Um, when he says, but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads or always causes us to, to triumph. Well, Paul has this picture of Roman army. And you know, uh, I'm sure, uh, how Roman armies would go and conquer other territories and cities. And the emperor or the general would come back, and he'd only come back in a procession when they won. And in that procession, they, they would have people who would have incense burning, and so there would be a fragrance there. They would have all the captives uh, marching, 
uh, with them. And uh, they'd have uh, people carrying uh, uh, the spoils from how they took that uh, new territory. And so Paul uses two different words here. First of all, a fragrance, and then he uses an aroma. And what he's talking about is this, that the aroma goes up to God. And he's using an Old Testament view here of, of uh, how when they worshipped and they burned incense and, and, and when they even uh, uh, did fires to consume sacrifices, there would be an, aro there would be an aroma that would go to, up to God. But then he also uses the word fragrance. Now, first of all then, and here's, here's the key of how to lead a triumphal procession, you need to see God is the key person. That's the aroma that he's talking about here. And so uh, we're, we're to uh, realize that what truly is important is not how we see ourselves or how we see the obstacles or how we see, uh, you know, other people, but how do we see God? W what possibilities... Does God see for us? That's what we need to trust. And secondly, he talks about service to God is always the goal, verse 15 and 16. And so there needs to be this sweet smell, an aroma and a fragrance. I guess I could ask you today, how do you smell? That would be a good question. And I wouldn't want anyone sitting next to you saying, <laughs> no, this isn't talking about, you know, bodily odors. He's not saying, well, did you use your deodorant today? Did you take a shower? Did you put some cologne on? No, he's talking about, first of all, when we serve God, it's, a, it's as a sacrifice to him, and there needs to be this aroma that's going up to God. But secondly, he talks about a fragrance, and the fragrance is not the aroma that goes up to God. The fragrance is, is how we impact the lives of other people. So when we share the good news of the gospel... God is pleased, and it's like an aroma that goes up to the throne of heaven. But the fragrance, then, is that we impact the lives of other people as well. And so service, then, needs to be our goal. And he talks about the vertical, Godward, and the horizontal, manward here. Now, the third thing is this, that we need to find our sufficiency from God, and that's a necessity. And so, again, despite, uh, you know, this... Uh, doom and gloom, Paul realizes that we are sufficient to do what God wants us to do, not because of our own strengths, but because of God. And so he asks this important question. You can mark it. Who is sufficient for these things? Well, he doesn't necessarily answer it uh, directly, but the answer is no one's sufficient. No one. And so what he's, he's emphasizing uh, here is that it's only because of God's grace that uh, we can do what God wants us to do and how God's uh, sufficiency is what helps us to uh, be able to handle even the greatest problems uh, of life. And so it's by God's grace uh, and power that we can do what God is calling us to do and to be able to handle uh, life. Now, he uses some interesting words here. We, we're not going to look at them in depth, but he talks about how he is uh, sincere, how he was called of God, sent by God. He lived and preached in the sight of God and did ministry in Christ. And so he, he even talks about a peddler. He says, I wasn't a peddler of the word of God. A peddler's talking about a salesman uh, who used unscrupulous uh, ways to gain money. It's often used of innkeepers who would water down wine and uh, sell that wine uh, watered down to cheat customers and to, to make a quick buck. And so Paul says, I didn't, you know, use the word of God in that way. He talks about how he lived in the sight of God before the gaze of God who sees all and knows all. Uh, we, we said and did what we had to say and what we had to do. And so, you know, we can ask ourselves then, you know, what blinds us from seeing what God can do? What are God's possibilities? Well, here's uh, my closing. I think it's important to have a takeaway. And here's my takeaway. What is of primary importance is not how we see ourselves or the obstacles in our way or how we see the people around us. But here's the key. It is how we see God and what the possibilities God sees with us and for us.
that we might be able to say, but thanks be to God. Let's pray. 